The idea of hitting a ball with a foot, a fist, or some sort of bat has been around for ages. I mean, football, tennis, baseball, rounders, squash, hockey, you name it. Many of these sports developed from other sports like languages. As you know, this video is about squash, and tennis is a very similar sport to squash. In 1148, French clerics played la pomme, the root of tennis, which developed into jeu de pomme, or simply tennis. Somewhere along the path to modern tennis, however, a new sport branched off la pomme, called fives. In fives, the ball is propelled against the wall with a bare hand. Soon after, in the unlikely birthplace of Fleet Prison in London, a new sport was born, bearing many similarities to fives. The sport was first recorded being played in 1820, but may have started being played as early as 1780. It was a weird mix of primitive squash and tennis, played by multiple prisoners hitting the ball against the wall as an exercise. The prisoners named the sport Rackets. Rackets escaped the prison shell inexplicably and spread to British schools like Harrow. In Harrow, rackets was played in courts with front walls, side walls, but no back walls. Different from how inmates randomly played it in Fleet Prison. Pupils in Harrow eventually discovered around 1830 that a punctured rackets ball, soft enough to squash on impact with the ball, produced a game with a huge variety of shots, including drop shots and bolts. Players now had to hit harder in order to get the ball to the back, and of course, players had to run a lot more now to reach the fast bouncing ball. This variant, named Racket Squash, proved popular so that in 1864, the school constructed the first four actual squash courts with four walls. Squash was officially founded as a sport in its own right. Instead of most articles and videos out there about squash's history, which focus on the sport's organizations and rule changes, this video will be focusing more on the nationality of the players. Once squash became a professional sport in England in 1907, England instantly became the strongest country in the world at squash. This was mostly because the Brits were the ones who'd invented the sport, and there were already lots of English people training for squash, but the sport wasn't even internationally recognized yet. Charles Reed was the English champion from 1925 to 1928, and won the first British Open in 1830, the biggest and only national tournament in the world at that time, and was runner-up the following year. Various other Englishmen were very strong during that period of time, including two-time champion and two-time runner-up Don Butcher, one-time champion and five-time runner-up Jim Deere. On the women's side, the British were doing much better. Since the Women's British Open started in 1922, until 1963, 40 years later, every finalist was British, including 10-time consecutive winner and two-time runner-up Janet Morgan, the sisters Joyce Cave and Nancy Cave, who collectively won six championships and nine runner-ups. However, as the sport became more popular worldwide, the English lost their dominance. Keep in mind, they still remained relatively strong, but the important fact is they lost their dominance. Hashim Khan was the first Pakistani to win the British Open, the aforementioned prestigious tournament. He traveled to London's Landos Club and won the tournament final breezily with a 9-5-9-0-9-0 against Egyptian Mahmoud Karim, winner of the four previous British Opens. Hashim Khan saw his nation curling its fingers around international squash for the first time. Hashim Khan blazed the trail, leading the way for two generations of legendary squash players that would soon follow. From 1951 to 1963, 22 of the 26 men's British Open finalists were Pakistanis, including all 13 winners. In fact, these 22 Pakistanis all had the same last name and belonged to the same family. 
the Khan family. Hashim's younger brother, Azim, became runner-up three times and won the tournament four times. His second cousin, Roshan Khan, won once and became runner-up twice. And his nephew, Mohibla, or Mo Khan, won once and became runner-up three times. Roshan Khan had two sons, Torsem and Jahangir. Torsem, the elder son, developed into an elegant player, rising up through the world rankings in the late 1970s. However, at age 27, and seemingly in perfect health, Torsem suffered a sudden heart attack and died while playing in Australia. His death shook Jahangir like a devastating blow, who was just 15 at the time. Torsem had been the jewel of a generation of Pakistani players, and many feared that with his death, the flame of Pakistani squash would fade into embers. Hashim Khan's generation and the generation below him had all grown old and retired, leaving Australia as the dominant squash playing nation. Indeed, since Mo Khan stopped playing, only one Pakistani had won the British Open from 1964 to 1981. The Pakistani grip was slipping. In 1982, Melbourne's Geoff Hunt had won six consecutive British Opens and three World Squash Championships, the previous one 9-0-9-3-9-3. A Pakistani saviour was desperately needed. And the saviour came. Jahangir Khan, younger brother of Torsam, once a sickly child, now a young prodigy, strode out proudly onto the podium. Determination Steeled by his brother's tragic death, Jahangir beat Joe Hunt in the 1981 World Championships at a young age of just 17. This victory marked the beginning of an unbeaten winning streak. Five years, 555 winning matches, five straight World Championships, and 10 straight British Open titles. And Jahangir Khan was widely considered the greatest men's squash player ever. As Jahangir's prime ended around 1990, Jan Shri Khan took over. Yes, another Khan, but he's not closely related to any of the aforementioned Khans. Jan Shri was just another Pakistani, six years younger than Jahangir. Jan Shri assumed the mantle and won eight world championships and six consecutive British Opens. Jahangir Khan was ranked world number one for seven years, 10 months, and Jan Shri Khan for eight years. Jan Shri and Jahangir's achievements are still considered a wonder to this day, and they've opened up debates about who was the stronger one. However, when Jan Shri's prime ended in around 1998, he faded from relevance, and so too did Pakistani squash. No successor appeared this time. If we leave out Jahangir and Janshir, the last four decades were devoid of extremely strong Pakistanis. Both major tournaments haven't seen a Pakistani man in the finals since Janshir Khan lost the 1998 British final. After over four decades of dominance, Pakistan's iron grip weakened, slipped, and finally let go for good. The reign of the Australians overlapped with the Pakistanis on the men's side. On the women's side, they were virtually undefeatable. On the women's side, after 40 years of British domination, remember, every finalist was English for the past 40 years, the then unheard of Heather Blundell won the British Open to everyone's amazement. She went professional literally just two years prior. She is best known for her name after her marriage, Heather McKay. After initially winning her first British Open, McKay went on to consecutively win the next 15 British Opens. In these 16 championships, she only lost two games. She also won her final games comfortably, including one time in 1968 when she beat her countrywoman Bev Johnson 9-0, 9-0, 9-0. Not a single point. When she retired in 1981, 
at the age of 40, McKay had gone 19 years undefeated. Seriously, since she went professional in 1960, her first loss was a 1960 close game where she lost to Australian Yvonne West at age 18. Her second defeat was to then world champion Fran Marshall in 1962. After these two initial losses, she went on to not lose a single match ever again. McKay wasn't the last strong Australian. Brilliant other Australians trailed her, including four-time British Open winner Vicky Cardwell, an eight-time British Open winner Susan Devoy, six-time British Open winner Michelle Martin, and four-time British Open winner Rachel Grinham. From 1962 to 2004, the year before Nicole David stepped into the spotlight, the winners of the British Opens were all Australian. From 1976, when the World Squash Championship started, to 2003, all but two World Championships were won by an Australian. On the men's side, things are also looking great for Australians as well. From Australian Geoff Hunt's British Open title in 1974, to David Palmer's last British Open title in 2008, only 13 British Open Championship finals didn't contain an Australian. Keep in mind, this was during the reign of Jahangir and Jan Shir Khan. Suddenly, in this last decade, there has not been a single Australian man or woman who got into the World Championship semi-finals or the British Open finals. Why? Australia in the 1980s had a million squash participants, a 16th of their entire population. This was the peak of squash in Australia. But nobody could have guessed that the dark days would come. Why is it that Australia, the strongest country in the world at squash, would suddenly fade from relevance? What was this and, and why this sudden disappearance? Squash court centers found it much more affordable to turn squash courts into gyms. And gyms really cut a swath through a lot of areas. Also, as people's lives became busier, Australians decided not to spend their small amounts of recreational time on sports, and the few people who played sports now had a gigantic menu of sports to choose from. Football, basketball, baseball, and various other international sports that had recently gained popularity in Australia. All of a sudden, from a million Scotch participants in the late 1980s to a mere 300,000 Scotch players, in 1998 to a disappointing 100,000 in 2013. The numbers continued to fall. The Australian period of dominance was over. Before the 21st century, there hasn't been a single Malaysian in a World Championship semi-final or a British Open final whether men's or women's. After Malaysian Nicole David stole the spotlight in 2005 when she won her first world championship title, it wasn't long before she became world number one. And when she got up there, boy, it was very hard to take her away from that position. Besides a brief four month period when Vanessa Atkinson from the Netherlands became world number one, Nicole David never left the number one spot until nearly 10 years later, in September 2015. David was row number one for 112 months and won the Hong Kong Open a record 10 times in a row, a feat arguably more impressive than Heather McKay's consecutive 16-year British Open titles, because competition in women's squash was much fiercer during David's reign. As time flowed and as David passed her prime, she still dwindled in the top 10s and achieved the world record for being in the top 10 for the longest time, 177 months. Soon after, David retired in 2019 and no other Malaysian has even entered the top 20s in the men's or women's PSA rankings since. Egypt was, at the start, not a weak country for squash. There were a couple pioneers. Egyptian F.D. Amer Bey was the first one. 
He won the British Open six consecutive times, from 1933 to 1938, and was considered the first truly dominant squash player. He retired from squash in 1938 while still being the top player at the sport in order to pursue a diplomatic career. After World War II, Mahmoud Karim was the second Egyptian pioneer. He won four consecutive British Opens from 1947 to 1950. Of course, the next two years, the legendary Pakistani Hashim Khan beat him, and he retired. From 1969 to 2003, there has only been one Egyptian finalist in the 35 men's British Opens. It's even more bleak on the women's side. There never was an Egyptian who entered the finals of 1922 to 2011 Women's British Open, nor was there an Egyptian who even entered the semi-finals of the World Championships until 2010. Looking at this data from every possible point of view, the Egyptians had no chance to ever make a comeback. It looked like the flame of Egyptian squash that was never too bright had already extinguished. That was until 2003. Amir Shabana charged through a star-studded road open like a wrecking ball. He eliminated David Palmer in four games, then defeated Egyptian number one, Karim Darvish in four, then beat Thierry Linku in the finals to clinch the championship title, becoming the first Egyptian world champion. In 2005, Shabana beat David Palmer in the World Open Finals in straight games and became the first Egyptian to be ranked number one in the world in April 2006. He then became world champion again in 2007 and 2009 and won the Hong Kong Open four times consecutively from 2006 to 2009. Similar to Hashim Khan or Heather McKay, Shabana stormed through the top rankings and led the way for other Egyptians to follow through. After Shabana had ruled as number one for two years and nine months, the crown was passed on to fellow Egyptian Karin Darwish for a year in 2009, then to fan favorite Rami Ashour for a year in 2010. 2011 was dominated by Englishman Nick Matthew and 2012 by Englishman James Wilstrop. But after that, the number one spot was constantly passed around between Rami Shore, an Egyptian, Frenchman Gregory Gautier, Mohamed al Jabagi, an Egyptian, and more recently, Ali Farag, another Egyptian. Rami Shore was regarded by some as the best squash player in the history of the sport. However, he suffered from hamstring injuries and often had to retire without even playing the tournament. Mr. Ashour is retiring due to injury. No, we can't believe it. The top five positions have been littered with strong Egyptians. Omar Massad, Karim Gawad, Tarek Momin, Marwin El Shabagi. By the end of 2019, the top four men in the world are all Egyptians and 11 out of the top 20 men in the world are Egyptians. Additionally, there are rising stars like Mustafa Asal, Yusef Ibrahim, Marwin Tarek, Noren Gohar, and El Hamami. Yes, Egyptians are also incredibly strong at juniors. Since Rami Ashour's first World Junior Championship win in 2004, 21 of the 28 men's World Junior Championship finalists were Egyptians. Egyptians are dominant even on the women's side as well. Once Nicole David finally got pushed off the number one spot, guess who took over? Yes, an Egyptian. Renim El Walili became number one, and the next four years just saw Noor El Shabini and El Walili's continuous fights for number one. At the end of 2019, the top four women in the world are all Egyptians the third place being Norin Gohar, and the fourth being Nor El Tayeb. The women's juniors are equally strong, if not stronger, than the men's juniors. From 2009 to 2019, all but one women's world junior finalists are Egyptians. And most of them have gotten into the finals multiple times. 
why were Egyptians able to take over? From a grand point of view, Egyptians are renowned for their insane variety of shots, their aggressive and unrelenting attacking style, and their unmatchable speed. They are also able to hit extremely hard, possess incredible stamina, and make extremely risky shots, previously unheard of. Why are Egyptians so strong now? In my trip to Egypt last December, I learned that young Egyptian juniors are exceptionally strong players. In January, the 2020 British Junior Open commenced, with the rule that only a maximum of five foreign players with the same nationality were able to join each age group of the tournament, except for, of course, Britain. Naturally, Egypt sent their five best players in each age group to compete, and they got astounding results. In the girls under 11 category, the five Egyptians got 10th, 9th, 5th, 4th, and 3rd. In the girls under 13 category, the five Egyptians got 8th, 7th, 4th, 3rd, and Amina Orfi, who lost only 25 points in the 18 total games she played, got 1st place. In the boys under 11 category, all five Egyptians entered the quarterfinals, and the maximum number, four Egyptians, entered the semifinals. It's the most obvious in the boys under 13 category. The five Egyptians that played in that category won first place, second place, third place, fourth place, and fifth place. When young Egyptians practice, they play extremely seriously, determination steeled by the hopes for a successful professional squash career in the future. Even at a young age, their decision-making skills are sharp. If they get enough opportunities to practice, it's only natural that they'd become extremely good players. And there are opportunities everywhere. They receive daily training and fitness sessions which build muscle and even have the pleasure of joining squash tournaments organized just for them every two weeks. Furthermore, many Egyptian squash legends that used to be world champions serve as role models for the next generation and coach them to victory. These coaches are also extremely dedicated to teaching the youth, and most of them are located in Cairo so they can train regularly against each other and push each other to new heights. This is the crucial difference between the Pakistani or Australian reign and the current Egyptian reign. The Pakistani reign ended because there just were no successors. The Australian reign ended because people just seemed to lose interest in the sport. The Egyptian reign will probably end at some point, of course, but it won't be in the near future. When Jahangir and later Jan Shri Khan retired, they weren't idled like how Amr Shabana and Rami Ashur were, and nobody really followed in their footsteps. After the Khans retired, they didn't really specifically coach any countrymen outside of their family. However, there are just too many strong Egyptian juniors, and it looks like it will continue being like this, under Egyptian dominance for a long, long time.